Right now, the medical profession is in crisis. Today, thousands of junior doctors are marching on Westminster, protesting against changes to our contract that threaten the future of the medical profession. The changes go far beyond what I can talk about today, but they will impact on patient safety, pushing an already overstretched profession to its limits. But it's not just the government changes that are going to affect healthcare in the future. Technology will radically change the, both the role of doctors and patients. I'm a junior doctor. I work in a major London hospital. I rarely use my stethoscope. In fact, most of what I do day to day is admin. It's important admin. It's admin that arranges blood tests, fills out forms for social services, sends letters to GPs. And of course, when I'm on call and have to assess a sick patient, well, then the stethoscope comes out. But the majority of what I do day to day could be, bu could be done better and more efficiently by a computer. I work in a leading London hospital. It's streets ahead in terms of technology. But as with the beginnings of every system, technology has, for the most part, made things worse and not better. We're suffering from what a colleague once called the blind digitization of the status quo. We are at the brink of a revolution in healthcare technology, but we are also at the edge of an innovation precipice. We have the potential to radically rethink the way we deliver healthcare, but at the same time, we're running the risk of cementing old, inefficient, and outdated modes of practice. I'll explain. Traditionally, the job of a junior doctor is to follow the consultant around on the ward round, scribble down what she says, and then carry it out. And this is all done in a paper folder by the patient's bedside. And that's where the patient's details, the observations, the drug chart, and all of the notes are kept. When a different team visits, they write in there. At the end of the patient's admission, the junior doctor summarizes the notes, writes up the medications, treatments, and results into a letter to go to the patient's GP. So how does technology fit into all of this? Well, at the moment, badly. Instead of a paper folder, we now have three online systems with three logins, each of which log you out after five minutes. All the teams seem to write in different ones, so you often information's missed. And none of the data communicates to any of the other systems. And so the job of the junior doctor remains the same, but times three. We follow the consultant round, we prescribe on one system, we order blood results on another, and then we write notes on the third. And then we copy the data across each of the three systems. And the software is so hard to use that our bedside manner has become appalling. Some of the ward rounds I see have four to five doctors attached to mobile laptops on wheels, forming a wall of computer screens around the patient's bedside. But the main problem is patient safety. The user, the user interface of these systems is incredibly difficult to use. Clinical medicine involves a high cognitive load. It takes up a lot of brain space. And if the software programs that we're using are also taking up a lot of cognitive load, then there's a higher risk of errors. I myself almost prescribed a blood transfusion on the wrong patient because the user experience design of the system hides the name of the patient in pale blue on a blue background in the top corner of the screen. And to exit that person's drug chart is a counterintuitive series of multiple clicks. In such a high risk field, it's appalling that these systems aren't designed with human factors in mind. As one of my consultants put it, it's like doing medicine with a frontal lobotomy. So, but my hospital is, is still one of the most forward thinking and they're aware of all these problems and are doing an amazing job of tackling them. But as with every beginnings of every system, it's still struggling to get it perfect. And obviously they face a lot of challenges. One of the main issues is that you have to design a system for many different types of clinical staff in many different specialties across the whole hospital. But outside the hospital, there's a technology revolution brewing in healthcare. Startup Health, an incubator in the US, reported recently that there were 7,600 new healthcare startups in the US this year, each of them creating new technology solutions for healthcare problems. So it's a, it's a dawn of a new industry, and it's also a perfect opportunity. 
It's a perfect opportunity to rethink the way we deliver healthcare. So what might healthcare look like uh, in the next 10, 20 years? What might, what might my job as a doctor look like? Well, let's start with the most important part of healthcare, patients. A power shift is going on in medicine. Patients were long the submissive subject of a doctor's decision. The phrase, a doctor's orders, epitomizes it. But why should we give you orders about your healthcare? Why should you be unable to access your own medical notes, unable to gain insights into your own physiology? Why is there a gatekeeper? Well, there's a number of historical reasons, some valid and some not so valid, why this has evolved to be the case. And there's a number of reasons why it will change in the future. One of which is that for centuries, medicine has been an art and not a science. We didn't really have an insight into your body either. The body, yes, but not yours. In fact, any insight we had was through a number, a numerous non-specific tests that give us that you need that you need a high uh, level of uh, knowledge about biochemistry, anatomy, and physiology in order to make a general heuristic estimate of what might be going on. This is what's called intuitive medicine. And historically, most diseases lay within the realm of intuitive medicine. But not in the future. We'll have more data. Not just the boring vital signs data that you get from your Apple Watch or Fitbit, which is only really useful when the body's under stress, if you're an athlete or if you're really, really sick. But precise genomic data data from the proteome, the metabolome, and even the microbiome that can tell us specifically about each disease. So in the future, we'll have more data, and more of these diseases will start to fall within the realm of precision medicine. Precision medicine doesn't really need a doctor. That sounds a little controversial, but let me explain. With precision medicine, you can put the diagnosis and treatment of disease firmly into the hands of the patient. In some cases, we're already starting to do it. Here's an example. A recent article in the British Medical Journal stated that women should be able to diagnose and treat their own urinary tract infections. A simple urine dipstick can tell you if you have a urine infection. It's a perfect example of precision medicine. It can't tell you what bacteria it is, but we don't really need to. The bacteria that cause urine infections are sensitive to the same antibiotics. And over 300,000 GP appointments every year are for urinary tract infections. Considering how easy it is to see your GP, how many people do you think end up in hospital with a serious case of urine infection because they can't get access to antibiotics in time? And already, there are technology startups developing digital home urine dipstick tests. You dip the stick in the urine, take a photo with your smartphone, it analyzes the color change and gives you the diagnosis. Other companies are creating medical tricorders straight out of Star Trek. You take a small device, apply it to your forehead, and you get vital signs data, such as blood pressure, temperature, and heart rate. What if you could dip the stick, take a photo with your smartphone, put the device to your forehead, send both the dipstick data and the vital signs data to your pharmacist. The vital signs data is important, as it would exclude a serious case of urinary tract infection, for which it would be better that you saw a doctor. The pharmacist could then prepare your prescription for you to pick up on the way to work. Of course, there are safety concerns. Uh, what if someone else uses the device? What if you need a different antibiotic? But, you know, doctors are trained to be conservative, and of course, sometimes it is important that we are. But we also need to think a bit more like designers. We need to acknowledge risks, but work to find a solution. So what else could change? Well, since we started with urinary tract infections, let's take a look at primary care. There are four things that primary care doctors do. The first is diagnose and treat disorders that lie within the realm of precision medicine urine infections, ear infections, fungal toenails. The second is uh, manage patients with chronic disease. And the third is carry out disease prevention and wellness checks. And the fourth is diagnose diseases that still lie within the realm of intuitive medicine, cancer, stomach ulcers, inflammatory bowel disease. These are diseases for which, at least at primary care level, there are no specific tests, and they 
require a detailed knowledge of signs and symptoms, risks and probabilities in order to make a diagnosis. So, technology in the future has the potential to decentralize the first three of those into the hands of the patient and make the fourth more efficient, cost-effective and precise than ever. Let's talk about the second, managing chronic disease. The recent explosion in health trackers and wearables and it will, will enable patients to take a little more control of the, their disease. For example, patients with heart failure could, wearing a simple vital signs patch the size of two pound coins, transmit their blood pressure and heart rate data directly to their doctor to predict when they might start to deteriorate. Patients with asthma can use a smart asthma inhaler, which will track the location, the frequency of their, of their asthma attacks, and also the air quality around them so they can then understand what their triggers are and start to up, up titrate their dose. But beyond monitoring, technology will allow us to prevent diseases that have a behavioral origin. Behavioral diseases form much of the burden of disease globally today. Smoking is the main cause of lung cancer, overeating of heart disease and diabetes. Behavioral diseases are best managed and treated with behavioral change. But until now, pharmaceuticals have been the only part of medicine that was scalable, affordable, and able to be standardized enough to be rigorously tested. Behavioral change was face to face. In fact, relegated to the GP's office to about 30 seconds where they ask, would you like to stop smoking? And then send you to a, a stop smoking clinic, which probably only gives you about an hour's engagement, which is not enough to help facilitate a significant lifestyle change but not now. We can now prescribe a digital cognitive behavioral therapy course that is delivered via a smartphone that is always in the patient's pocket to support them 24 seven. And some of these are delivered via some very engaging cartoon avatars that mean that they feel more like entertainment than medicine. So patients now have the tools to manage much of their disease, whether or not everyone actually will is another matter entirely and some people will will not harness that technology but in the future we'll be able to gather a lot more data as well on our patients and by having more data we'll be able to predict and detect disease at an earlier stage thus reducing the burden of job number three the junior doctor of the doctor the, the health and wellness checks so what remains well the diagnosis of diseases that lie within intuitive medicine. New diagnostic techniques will make the diagnosis of these even more data-driven. Medicine will move from being an art to becoming a data science. In fact, new technologies are starting to automate some of the doctor's skills at diagnosis. Already there are teams applying machine learning, a form of artificial intelligence, to the recognition and identification of cancer cells on images of tissue biopsies, or to identify tumors in MR MRI or CT scans. And these algorithms are starting to outperform the best radiologists and pathologists. This has huge implications for the future of the profession. What happens to your job when a computer can do it better? Others uh, attempting to apply artificial intelligence to master the art of the differential diagnosis. Using massively parallel supercomputers, querying the entire corpus of clinical and academic medical knowledge, the aim is to put the best doctor in the world into everyone's pocket. So far they have had little success. Image recognition of the kind that radiologists and pathologists do is a much more simple computing problem than coming to a diagnosis from often highly variable symptoms and signs data presented by patients. So what will remain? Well, caring for patients, the doctor's most important role, and one that is currently obscured and obstructed behind a laptop screen. But as you can see, the journey from health technology as it is today to the opportunities of the future is a long one. There's a lot of fear in medicine around technology. Currently poorly implemented systems damage the doctor-patient relationship and make the job inefficient and prone to errors. There's fear around security. US hospitals have already had data breaches of patient data. And there's fear around the future, the gradual attrition of doctor's skills. But even in a future where 
many of the aspects of diagnosis and treatment can be done better by a machine than by a human. Healthcare is a highly emotional field and will always need people. The best part of being a doctor is being able to soothe and reassure people in distress, whether that's patients or their families. So I hope for a future where technology fades into the background, facilitates my job, frees up my time and cognitive capacity to better fulfill that role. Thank you.